If you would, for a few moments, turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 18. In John 18, Jesus is being brought before Pilate. And in verse 33, it says, Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus. And he said to him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, saying, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said to him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? Well, that's a question people are asking today, and what's the truth? It's been said that we live in a post-truth world. We live in a world of fake news, wondering who in the world to believe. Do we believe the New York Times or the Washington Post? Do we believe CNN, ABC, NBC, CBS? Do we believe Fox? Uh, who do we believe? Do we believe the scientists that are screaming global warming? Do we believe the, the, uh, the science, quote unquote, of evolution? What do we believe? What do we believe? I was thinking about something that Paul wrote to Timothy, and I just found this really appropriate. It's out of 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verses 20 and 21, Paul writes, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings, and I like this line, and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be to thee. Amen. Pseudoscience, false science. How would you define false science? Well, this is how I define it. I define false science as science that either disputes or seeks to disprove the word of God. And I also define false science as science that's driven by politically correct thought and the purpose of furthering a globalist agenda. That's the way I define false science. But if you go back and you study history, you'll find that some of the greatest scientists that ever lived were believers. They were Christians. They were Bible-believing. Uh, we would today, people would call them radical fundamentalists. <laughs> Two that just immediately jump out to me is uh, Isaac Newton and, and uh, Blaise Pascal. Great mathematician, a great uh, uh, philosopher and scientist and engineer, both of them. And both these men fully believed what Paul writes in Romans chapter 1 when he said, you know, the hidden things of God can be clearly seen by the things that are made or the things that are. In other words, these men believed that you could look at the at nature around you. It's like Mayfrey was talking about the intricacies of the flowers this morning. They fully believed that you could look at what God's created and you could begin to understand things about him and about the way the universe worked just by observing what he's done. Take Newton's first law of motion. That's one of my favorites. Sir Isaac Newton said, an object in motion will stay in motion with the same speed and the same direction unless it's acted upon by an external force. So, you know, if you throw something up in the air, it goes up for a while and then it comes back down. The reason it comes back down is not that it decided to turn around, but because some other force operated on it, right? And we know what that force is. Gravity. An object in motion tends to stay in motion at the same speed in the same direction until it's operated on by an external force. Now, this is a little deviation for where I'm going, but I'm bad to chase rabbits anyway. You need to get this. This is good stuff. This is, this is from a scientist who's really a scientist. All right? Think about this. The only thing that can change the direction and the speed 
of an object in motion is an external force. As you read the Bible, the Bible tells us that we live in the fallen creation. And that fall continues. And that fall is evidenced by the fact that wickedness increases and violence increases. And, you know, all, all around us we see the world getting worse and worse and worse. It's a result of sin, of course. And if you ask most people, or if you ask most religions, how would you stop that? How would you stop that fall? They would simply say, well, turn away from that which is wrong. Turn away from violence. Turn away from evil. Turn away from these things and do that which is right. But the problem with that is it violates the first law of motion. That object that's moving in that direction can't just stop and turn around on its own. It has to be affected by a force from outside this object, an external force, a force not of this world. Well, of course, there is good news in this dark world is that force has already happened. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. A force not of this world had to come into this world and act on this world in order to change the direction that we were going in. But now understand something else. That object has to have that force operate on it before it can change its course and change its direction. Remember what the Bible says in John 1 and 12. It says, to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. In other words, we have to allow that force to work on us if we want our direction changed. We have to allow him to touch us. We have to allow his power and his love and his mercy and grace to change our direction or we'll stay in that same motion of a fallen world unless we have that external force working on us. So who do we believe today? Let's go over to Psalm 19. David was in the same frame of mind that Mayfrey was this morning when he wrote Psalm 19. He was talking about how the heavens would declare the glory of God and the firmament would show his handiwork. He said, you can look around and you can see God in everything that exists because it's got his fingerprint. It's got his signature. You can see it. And he says, you know what? Every day, every day speaks about him. Every night shows his knowledge as those stars come out and as they, you know, they just, you look up and you see this awesome universe, this intricacy in everything that's created, this evidence of design. Boy, we were really reaching when we came up with the theory that everything just kind of evolved out of the ooze. And the only thing that was needed was billions and billions and billions of years. I mean, <laughs> the, greatest, <laughs> the greatest need this world has today is common sense. And it's the most elusive commodity that exists. I mean, you know, we can look around and we can see what happens when things are left to, them, to, to themselves. The tendency is towards decay, not towards order. And what makes you think that if you add even more time, it won't be more decay rather than all of a sudden things come together and it becomes a sophisticated, complicated, intricate system. Yeah, right. Man, somebody was really tripping that day. Anyway, <clears throat> so David keeps on going and he says, you know what? He says, there's no speech, no language. There's nowhere on earth that you can go that you can't see the fingerprint of God in what he's created whether it's in the flowers or the firmament, doesn't matter. You look around and you can see that intricate design and design requires a designer. We know that. I mean, it's just common sense. So David begins to write all this stuff down and then he begins to write about the word of God. And I love this. Let's, let's pick up the, the account here in verse seven. We're talking about who we can believe today in a, in a post-truth world. He says in verse 7 of Psalm 19, he says, the law, and if you look that up in the Hebrew, it's the Torah. In other words, the, the, the word that God gave to Moses on the mountain. He said, the word of God is perfect, converting the soul, and the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. 
what it's saying is this. God's word is complete, undefiled truth. That's what it is. And here comes Newton's first law. Converting the soul. Converting means to turn. That outside force comes in, and for those that will receive it, it turns them around and makes them come back in the direction that they need to go. The word of the Lord is perfect, turning the soul. And the testimony of the Lord is sure, which means it's trustworthy. It means it's verified, and it makes wise the simple. Who is, who is the simple in this world? Well... The Bible talks about the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul was worried that people would be drawn away from the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of the plan of salvation, the, the simplicity of the love of God toward a fallen world, that if they would just accept the truth of, of, of the cross, the truth of the resurrection, the truth of the sacrifice, the truth of the price that was paid for one reason, and that was the love of God. If we don't get drawn away from that simple message, then we, we become wise. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. So as we look around, we can see that there's a lot of fools in this world. But the word of God can transform a fool into somebody that's wise if we'll accept it, if we'll receive it. Then we keep going. It says the statutes. Now understand every one of these expressions are just another term for the word of God. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And that word right in Hebrew is an interesting word. It means straight. It means this. It means God shoots straight with you when he gives his word. It's, he's, not, he's not, you know, soft soaping anything. He's not, uh, you know, covering over problems. He's not being deceptive in any way. It's the straight scoop, as we say in this word. God's word is correct and it's straight. And I like this. It says, and it rejoices the heart. In other words, it causes that inner man to rejoice. We mentioned Pascal a few minutes ago, and Pascal had a famous saying. He said, within every man, in the inner part of every man is a God-shaped vacuum or void. And we spend our lives trying to fill that emptiness with everything, and nothing will fill it except God himself. See, these men had common sense, and these men had an understanding of the world around them because they saw it in the light of the Word of God. And the Word of God is, as, as David has been saying, it's, it's, it's perfect, it's, it's sure, it's, you know, uh, it's right, it shoots straight with you. And then it says the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes God's word brings up you know there's so much there's so much deception in the world today and 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 sometimes the truth that we hear is a half truth a partial truth somebody once said you know a, a half truth is a is a whitewashed lie you know it's just something to cause you to listen and then take you in a different direction when Satan was talking with Eve in the, Adam of, uh, Eve in the Garden of Eden, he was, he was doing the same thing. He told Eve, he said, if you eat of the fruit of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, now, part of that was true. They wouldn't know good and evil. But you see, they weren't going to be like God. They were going to be way away from him because, you know, when we sin, when we rebel, we're certainly not being like God. Be careful with half-truth. Be careful with truth that's been diluted and spun in some direction. All right, let's, let's, let's look at this again. The commandment of the Lord is pure, and it enlightens the eyes. It brings illumination. God's word brings light into the darkness. History has proven that wherever the word of God goes, darkness has to fall back. Societies are changed by the word of God, by the moving of the spirit of God. God's word brings a purity into an impure world and it brings light in the darkness. Verse 9 says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord. You know, I've heard people say we shouldn't fear God. Well, I want to tell you something. I fear him because I'm going to have to stand before him one day. 
I don't fear that I'm going to be lost because Jesus settled that. But I fear giving account of my stewardship. I fear standing there and, and, and knowing that I could have done more, knowing I could have been more obedient, knowing that I could have been less selfish, knowing that I could have, you know, on and on and on. I fear that. I fear it. Because I know what he did for me. I know the price that was paid for me, or, or at least to what extent I can comprehend it. So there is a fear there. In fact, you know, God was talking, Jesus was talking, and he said, the one you need to fear is the one that can condemn you to hell. And you know what? God is the judge. He's the only judge. And folks, we need to fear God. And one of the greatest problems in this world today is there is no fear of God. People don't fear the Lord. And when I was growing up, even people that were so far away from him that, you know, it was pathetic, they still feared God. You, wouldn't, you couldn't have paid people to desecrate a church. You couldn't have paid people to desecrate a, a cemetery. You couldn't have paid them to rob the church because they feared God. They may have been, you know, somebody far away from the Lord, but they still had a fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. There is, there, there is a place for a holy fear of one so awesome and so great and that holds all judgment in his hand. The fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. And then it says the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. The judgments of the Lord are certain and trustworthy is what it means. And they have the effect of cleansing. God's word is certain, trustworthy, and it will cleanse us and make us right with him when we accept the word of God. We're talking about what we can believe today. What's the truth? What can we base our lives on, our decisions on, our future on? Verse 10, David said, more to be desired are they than gold. That's the word of God. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb. God's word is more desirable than the refined, pure gold. It's sweeter than honey. I love what Job said. He said, I've esteemed or desired the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And think about what Job was going through. Think about the, the suffering that he had in his life. And yet he said, he, he said you know, I, I, I treasure God's word. I'm more hungry for God's word than I am the food that sustains me and keeps me alive. David said that, that he fed on God's word and God's word to him was a joy. How many of us can say that today? How many of us can say that God's word is really a joy, that we look forward to reading that word, to hearing that word? How many of us just, just love to meditate on the word of God? The truth is not that many. Not that many Christians really love God's word and love to spend time in God's word and, and, and study that word and let it get down in our hearts. And the reason you can tell that is because of the dust on the Bible. Because you can tell that when the Bible doesn't look like it's ever been opened. Folks, listen. We, we, you can't make it with just an hour on Sunday. You can't make it with just a little time on Wednesday night. You've got to spend time in this word every day. What did David say? He said, thy words were found and I ate them. I made them a part of my life. I consumed them. God's word needs to be a joy to us. We need to look forward to that, the time that we get to open it and spend time because it's God talking to you. It's his heart. It's his it's the truth being instilled into your life when you begin to feed on God's word. Then he says in verse 11, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. When we take God's word, it admonishes us, it teaches us, it enlightens us, and it warns us. You see, when we study the Word of God, it lets us know where the danger is. When we study the Word of God, it lets us know what to stay away from. It warns us about things to come. It tells us what to look out for. And if we've hid that Word in our heart, what does the Bible say? Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. 
That word's a protection for us. We need his word inside us. And in keeping them, there is great reward. And it's an interesting word that's used in the Hebrew. It says, in keeping them, there is great reward. And the word reward means consequence, gain, and end. And I had to start thinking about that for a little bit. You know, the, everything we do has consequences, right? Well, the consequence that comes from studying the word of God is a good one. It's one of those that we like to have. And it tells us that there's going to be a, a gain. We're going, to, we're going to receive something wonderful. But the other one is really interesting. It says we'll have a good end. A good end. I was thinking about, you remember when Balak, the people of Israel were coming through his land, King Balak. And he sends for Balaam. And Balaam is supposed to be able to come and pronounce a curse on Israel. So that, they, so that Balak can defeat them or so something horrible will happen to them and they'll leave his country. So he bribes Balaam to come and get up on the mountain and speak a curse over Israel. And what happens when Balaam opens his mouth? He said, let my last end be like his. In other words, instead of cursing Israel, God gave him a prophetic view of how Israel would end up. And Balaam said, boy, I wish my end could be like his. If we will dwell on the word of God, if we'll let the word of God become our truth, if we'll feed on the word of God, our end is going to be great. It's going to be awesome. God's word lets us know what the end is for the child of God and what's in store a little bit. He gives us just kind of a teaser, so to speak. Because the Bible says, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those that love him. John got to see just a little bit of it in that time he spent on the Isle of Patmos and the Lord took him into heaven and, and he began to see what was there. But you know, there was so much that he saw that he said he just couldn't write. The end for the Christian in keeping the word of God, we're going to have a tremendous end so what do we believe do we believe the vain babblings of men the opposing views of pseudoscience or do we believe, or do we believe the word of god think about what we've just said think about what david wrote talking about god's word god's word history has proved that it's the one thing that can turn the soul around it's sure and it's certain and it makes the simple wise it'll rejoice our heart when we Accept the truth of the word of God. It's pure. It gives light in the darkness. It's clean. It endures forever. It will cleanse us. It's, it's, it's something that will never change down through the ages. It's the, the anchor. It's the foundation that we can base our life on and not worry that next week it's going to change and be something else. It's true and righteous. It's not deceiving. It's more precious than anything else we can have. And we're going to be rewarded and we're going to have a great end if we'll listen to it. Then I was thinking about what Paul wrote to Timothy about those that refuse to give heed to the word of God. Let's go back over into chapter 6 of 1 Timothy for just a minute. In that same chapter where he's talking about, you know, don't listen to those, that false science because it will draw you away from the truth of the word of God. In 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 3, Paul says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is according to godliness, he's proud. He knows nothing. He's doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof comes envy, strife, railing, evil surmising, perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds, destitute of truth. So that tells you apart from the truth of God where we end up if we refuse that truth. And we see so much of that in the world today. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us there with be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare 
and many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It tells you what happens when we will not listen to the word of God. When we don't hold the word of God as the ultimate truth, as the foundation, as the measurement, as the standard by which all things are judged. And when we go off and we start debating different things and we're following different philosophies and we're listening uh, to, you know, to different theories and, and they draw our heart away from the simple truth of the word of God then all these things happen, envy, strife, uh, arguments, perverse disputing, uh, having our minds corrupted, being destitute of the truth, and our focus is on ourselves. We become covetous, and all we want is what we can get and what's in it for me. And God says, that's, that's not going to work out good for you. <laughs> You're going to have a hard life. You're going to end up in destruction and in perdition. And then he goes on. Let's go down to verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. You see, he said, it's, this life of faith, it's not as easy as falling off a log. It's not a bed of roses. It's a fight. It's a struggle. You know, the Bible tells us, we've, we've talked, and Jeremiah's talked many times about, you know, the, the armor of God. You don't need armor unless you're in a battle. You don't need armor unless there's a conflict going on. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and so on and so forth. There's a war going on, and the war is for your mind. The war is for your thoughts. And the input, what we're feeding on, determines how that battle is going to go. If we're going to feed on the Word of God, if we feed on the truth, we're going to win the war. We're going to win that battle. But if we feed on lies, if we feed on man's opinion, if we feed on all this other stuff, we're going to lose it because what we feed on will cause something to grow, either the truth or a lie. So be careful what you listen to. Don't don't give heed to that vain babbling as Paul described it to Timothy. But follow after these things of God. So as we live in this post-truth world, what do we believe? Well, the bottom line is this. There's only one truth. And Jesus said it in John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. So we have an option. We can believe this to be the truth and we can base our lives on it and live our life on it and base our eternal destiny on it or we can go off in all these other directions and listen to all the other inputs but folks listen history has proven men's lives have proven that this is the word of god and it's exactly as david described it it's as paul described it it's as all these others described it it's the truth and the bible says you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Let's pray. Father, I pray for the men in this room this morning. And God, as fathers and grandfathers, Lord, we have an awesome responsibility. The word says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And those of us that are here today, knowing you, walking with you are here because we had somebody in our life that taught us about you. It may have been a parent, it may have been a grandparent, it may have been someone that was stepping into that role, someone that kind of took us under their wing. But we're here today because somebody told us about Jesus. And Lord, I pray that we as men would be found faithful today to stand before our children and grandchildren and other, others around us that we have any effect on their life. And Lord, that we would, as Kelly has already said, preach the gospel and use words if necessary. Lord, that we would live that godly life, that we would cause those about us to see that we believe that this word is the truth. 
Father, I pray not just for the men, but for all of us. Mothers, grandmothers, those that one day will be, and those that are mothers and grandmothers to children that are not their own. God, I pray that every one of us would live our lives based on one simple fact. Thy word is truth. And when we're inundated with fake news, inundated with men's opinions and theories, inundated with the lies of the enemy, that we would hold them all up against the standard of the word of God. And that way we would know the truth. Father, I pray that we would be people of truth. Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this day. God, I ask you to bless each one that's here. Thank you for godly fathers. Thank you for godly men. Thank you for godly families. And Lord, I pray that every child and grandchild that have anything to do with us will grow up knowing the truth of the word of God. We love you so much this morning. Thank you for your truth that came to us. That outside force that came and worked to turn back something that was falling into the abyss. And that's each one of our lives. Thank you for that truth. Go with us now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. Remember, Vacation Bible School meeting right now. Have a great Father's Day.